All right, so welcome. We're going to be joined with Jamie, my beautiful fiance. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I know. I know. Let the boomer jug flow. Because they're going to they're gonna say boomer tech. Can you guys hear me? I know. I know. See, the chat's behind, so now I have to see 100 comments about it being muted. Yeah. I know. So my beautiful fiance, Jamie, is piped in live from... She's coming to us live from a Illuminati cult ritual. Not really. Jamie, are you there? I'm here. Yep. All right. Uh, can everybody hear Jamie? Can you hear me? Hello, everyone. Yes, they can hear you. All right. So the sound is good. We are going to be talking about that ever-present creepy topic tonight of ritual cult abuse. Beyond, I decided at first I had something like you know cult abuse, blah, blah. And then I thought, no, put beyond MK Ultra ritual cult abuse, because in many ways, the, uh, a lot of cults do continue on the uh, phenomena of MK Ultra and ritual abuse. So we're going to be talking about the, not, that tonight. Jamie has done some research, actually done a lot of research on this topic. She has her books, which you can also buy uh, at my website. You can get signed copies of Hollywood Mind Control, her very flowery uh, coffee table book from Jay's analysis in the shop. Uh, Jamie, how are you? I'm great. Good. What is the book we're going to be talking about tonight that you have uh, just finished and researched? Well, I was trying to steer away from these kind of dark subjects. I thought I was all over and past that. And I wanted to do some lighthearted fun stuff or just something that wasn't so dark and creepy like you said but it always comes back because I had this book and a friend of mine from Austin gave it to me and he called me up and he said I need that book back because I want to write a book and uh, it's very valuable now <laughs> so I'm done borrowing it and I got it off the shelf and I started flipping through it and I found all my pages of notes and I thought well I never did much with this I read this whole book and I have all these notes and uh, thought maybe before I send the book back, I will give you guys a show from it. Excellent. And what's the book? It's called Cult and Ritual Abuse. It's History, Anthropology, and Recent Discovery in Contemporary America by James Randall Noblet and Pamela Sue Perskin. And this so, is not a conspiracy book. That's the first thing we want to talk about is that okay. tonight we're not covering conspiracy books. Uh, that is a, they are what, psychiatrists or something? Yeah, they're both um, psychiatrists, therapists, licensed doctors. Um, it's a scholarly book. It's uh, Westport, Connecticut, London is the publisher or Prager. Yeah, so it's so, an academic press. This it's is not, not a, a kooky self-published. Um, yeah, right, it's not the uh, biography, yeah, exactly. autobiography, you know. Not that those aren't believable, but, you know, this is something that was researched very heavily, so. Right. All right, so uh, start us off on this topic. Uh, you know, you've written a book on it. I've got two books on it. We, we've dealt with cults a lot. You've been on with me in multiple live streams and interviews discussing cults. Um, what about this one, this book is unique? Um, just that it was the first one that I had read that was written by a doctor. Um, I and read not, not a cons conspiracy theorist. Right, just an, a normie psychiatrist who was trying to help his patients and he kept um, coming across instances of cult and ritual abuse and dissociative identity disorder so much so that um, it became a theme in his practice and he ran a, a, against a lot of opposition doing this, a lot of disbelief. We'll get to that in the second part. A lot of the false memory syndrome foundation came after him. Um, and he is basically laying out that there is a loosely connected network of cults that are purposely trying to create um, multiple personality dissociative people. And this is not something that he set out to prove. This was just based upon the scientific, you know, empirical evidence and, and testimonies of his patients. So it wasn't like he had a, a um, presupposition about this in the first place. 
Yeah, I remember one of the books I read a long time ago that introduced me to it was also a psychiatrist. Uh, it, the book is called Switching Time, where he recounts the story of somebody who claimed to have undergone ritual abuse. And then uh, more recently, I did a talk, I think a year or two ago, from Dr. Colin Ross. He's kind of the most well-known guy for this stuff. So you can find his book where he discusses what he calls Osiris Complex MPD. And this is his account of the many cases of it. Um, he also has a book on this too, uh, Satanic Ritual Abuse by Colin Ross. And then he has his analysis of the CIA doctors. MK. So these are normal, like academic doctor era <laughs> level stuff. This is again, not the world of kooky conspiracy. Now a person might, you know, you might theoretically reject these people's claims, but uh, the point is again, that it's not from the world of, of conspiracies that, that we're doing this. So tell us about the book. Yeah. So, I did not reread the whole book, so it's not going to be super cohesive, but I thought I would just take my notes and then we would go to the page and then we would find out what the heck I was talking about <laughs> or find out what I made a note about. And I thought it would be a fun way to just gloss over it. And if you're interested, it would make a really good um, addition to your cult and ritual satanic abuse library <laughs> right and by the way i'll put my uh, talk that i did on this uh, uh topic a few years ago into the chat too if anybody wants to refer yeah. back funnily to enough he was in the end of the book he starts talking about all the different cults we talked about in that one show we did in florida the yeah top 10 cults yeah really so those are, yeah you're talking about the guy that that the book you're doing tonight he yeah. talks about some of the cults that we covered in our last show Yes. Okay. Yeah. So he, in the introduction, he goes on to say, this book describes one therapist's personal experience evaluating and treating individuals making these allegations. Um, the initial response to the allegations, he says, was he was incredulous, but all the patients were demonstrating very similar psychiatric symptoms like trance reactions, multiple inner identities, um, amnesia, all of these symptoms of ritual abuse and dissociative identity. And so he started to examine the historical and anthropological background of the practices, and he found a bunch of crazy stuff. So he says that Colin Ross these says religions... The same, Colin Ross says the same thing, too, just as a side note. He says that when he encountered this with a lot of the patients he was seeing, he didn't immediately give credence to every story, but he recognized that these people at least had something going on, right? He says, I can't confirm <laughs> or deny all these people's stories. I, there, I have no way to do that. He's like, but there's definitely something to this because so many people were having these similar claims. Yeah. So he says about the um, anthropological background, he said, Fraternal organizations were found, which ostentend, how does that word? Ostentatiously. Ostensibly. Ostensibly. Ostensibly, yeah. Used traumatic rituals for the purpose of creating altered states of consciousness. Apparently, such mental states have sometimes been viewed as sacred, as the magical catalyst for profound visions or possession by gods. In other cases, these techniques have allegedly, allegedly been used to establish a power kind of psychological control, which until recently existed underground in secrecy, essentially unknown within the mental health professions. So this is kind of a new thing, but um, in the first chapter, I think one of my first notes was about Freud, so we'll get to that in a second. He says, their conclusion was that the diagnosis of multiple personality disorder is a Western version of what has been known historically and anthropologically as possession. It is possible that some variants of possession and other cultures and other times have also resulted from such abusive practices. As the reader will see, there's historical and anthropological evidence that this may be the case. So this goes back far farther than MKUltra. It's a cultural thing. Right, because and sometimes you'll get the claim people will say uh, MPD, DID can't be real because supposedly it's only an American phenomenon. Well, I'm not convinced that it is only American phenomenon. And by the way, if we include mm -hmm. the notion of possession, which by the way, Ross does in his books, then uh, it would extend beyond just modern North America because the skeptics will say, oh, this is a result of the satanic panic, uh, which is all fake. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but not if mm-hmm. we consider the phenomena of possession, which, by the way, some there are some in the psychiatric world that will write on possession as well. Mm-hmm. So here, he's my first note that I made, it says, an early account of dissociation, 1894, page 21. One early account of dissociation was derived from the general concept of psychological mechanisms of defense first presented in a paper written in 1894, so that's a long time ago, by Sigmund Freud entitled The Psychoneurosis of Defense, and labor elaborated by his daughter, Anna Freud. That's interesting. Um, essentially, Freud, the theory, really. Yeah. He says, essentially, the theory of defense mechanisms postulates that people are able to protect themselves from emotional discomfort or even trauma through a variety of unconscious mental maneuvers in which the individual is usually unaware of the ongoing defense mental process. So that's a big point I want to stress here. Like, these people don't even know what they're doing sometimes, a lot of time. The people undergoing it or the psychiatrists? Yeah. No, the, the people with the multiple personality sometimes don't even know mm-hmm. they have it. That's like a really scary thing to think about. He says, but then this is one of the central problems in psychology. Internal mental and emotional processes are not normally observable in a purely objective manner. Psychology is at its best the objective study of subjectively reported phenomena. So... That was my first page 22. Oh, and then he goes on to talk about how low income most of his patients are Mm -hmm. because they can't function in society when they're like this. You know, they have all these different personalities. They have cults, um, family members. Yeah, there's a, by the way... uh, for people that are skeptical, there's a great HBO documentary that has been on YouTube forever and ever. Uh, if you just type in multiple personality disorder, you'll find the HBO documentary. And within that documentary, multiple times it comes up that people dealt with uh, abuse and they dealt with uh, being raised in some kind of weird cult. So, mm-hmm. um, And this is just a mainline documentary. So uh, if, you, if you're a skeptic, I would say go watch that because it's pretty convincing. I mean, unless the whole documentary is fake, which I don't think it is. It's obvious that they're, that they're interviewing real people. Um, it backs up a lot of what Jay, Jamie's talking about from a, a, a purely uh, just a documentary, documentary perspective. By the way, there's other documentaries on YouTube, or there used to be two or three years ago that I've mentioned, but that uh, HBO one is, is particularly good, I thought. Mm-hmm. So this kind of struck a sad chord with me because um, a lot of these people are essentially like duds, and when they try to create some kind of MPD they're not always highly artistic and successful like like a Britney Spears or like Lady Gaga or somebody who has all the money to see any doctor they want so most of his yeah, so patients, they end up like multiple MIGs in uh, Silence of the yeah. Lambs. So they're like, yeah. They're, yeah. they're stuck in a nasty cell next to Hannibal Lecter or something yeah or they're just you know living off welfare or on drugs or homeless I right. mean imagine how many people well, a lot of the vets right so, yeah, a lot of the people who've written on this topic uh, um, we'll talk about the experimentation on vets uh, mm-hmm. I think in the classic book by John Marks uh, CIA and the search for mentoring candidate he'll talk about veterans so some, mm-hmm. some people speculate the reason you see like a lot of veterans just kind of wandering around isn't just because they were addicted to you know heroin in uh, Vietnam or whatever but that they were uh, experimented on yeah, definitely. Oh, and by the way, I think Bowert discusses this in his book, Upright Smoker, which I've covered these books, but I've done lectures on all these books. And uh, The Homeless is another one, too. We've actually, we covered this on the last Boiler Room that was on my channel, where homeless were being tested in these different programs for putting them into, uh, uh, like, FEMA-type situations, putting them into, uh, giving them... Uh, microchips so that they could just scan to get any any objects that they wanted and uh, uh we'll get to this in a, in a little bit but uh as i was reading the kurt barker book that you recommended he actually talked about this he said that uh, they experiment on homeless people and he actually wrote that a long time ago so that was interesting was what was the roach motel thing you were talking about did you get to that part yet? Yeah, uh, we'll get to that maybe in a little bit. But uh, he speculates that, that kind of the depopulation agenda would relate to the putting people into the big coffin apartments and stuff like that. So that's what he's talking oh, about. Oh, yeah. That's in Holy Mountain. Right, right. 
Yeah. Yeah. By the way, we so, have been slowly working our way, Jamie and I, through Holy Mountain. <laughs> I can't stand the, the movie so gross and it's so hard to watch that I have to like do little segments. We can only do like 20 minutes at a time. I can only do 20 minutes because I find it very distasteful and blasphemous. So uh, I don't, tried rec- three times. I don't recommend anybody watch Holy, Minute, How, Holy Mountain, but so many people have asked me to analyze Holy Mountain. I, I feel like I ought to do it, but uh, it's pretty gross. Yeah. But yeah, but so we, I but should, I should go ahead. Pure esoteric Hollywood, isn't it? It's the most esoteric Hollywood probably next to, you know, like Oswald <laughs> Shutter or whatever, but. I should mention too, um, if you find that hard to believe, remember that if you if you get uh, Ross's book, the CIA Doctors, um, he mentions all the encultured doctors who were involved in experimentation on people in psych wards and prisons. So obviously, mm-hmm. I mean, why they wouldn't have any problem experimenting on homeless people if they're going to experiment on t- people in prisons. Uh, and he mentions Jolyon West, Martin Orn, you yeah. and, and Cameron, Johns Hopkins University, um, Esther Brooks, uh, you know, all the kind of known uh, uh, Jose Delgado. Right? They're all they're all in here doing that very thing. Yeah. At the end of the book, we'll get to that. But um, it relates to this is how the mental health services are so overcrowded right now that they can even hardly get resources to everyone because everyone is crazy in some way yeah and barker by, mentions that too by the way that a lot of the dissociation and insanity uh of the elite in terms of these studies uh he that that they would be projecting that onto society that was the goal uh, yeah and so that i think uh vindicates a lot of his claims and, well that's an alchemical as above so below principle right. isn't it yeah yeah so so tell right. us more about this book Okay, so my next note, it just says art trance, page 26. So what do I mean by that? Um, da, da, da. So obviously he's a therapist, so he is having people do art therapy. Mm-hmm. And he says, sometimes in art therapy, I have observed MPD patients to enter an apparent trance state after looking at another patient's artwork. Surprisingly, this is especially true when the artwork contains some of the stereotypical geometric designs that many of them are prone to draw periodically i ask patients to describe their feelings or to free associate to their drawings or to their drawings of others often in the process the patients verbalize important information relevant to their recovery in some cases the patients say that they remember seeing the geometric designs or symbols as part of bizarre cult rituals in which they had allegedly been present so this immediately i know i would wrote this down because of movies and music and media and pop culture it just feeds back into it because they're all looking at each other's art and music and yeah, it's becoming like a more feedback, it's a feedback loop symbiotic thing, yeah. yeah yeah exactly they don't have to put everybody into a joe rogan isolation pod and feed <laughs> like mind control assassin techniques into their head through imprinting yeah. all they have to do is just put it out there in the culture and everybody undergoes it yeah and then they rehash it, like, you know, with uh, why does every fashion magazine have all seeing eyes everywhere and everybody's going, oh, you know, right? Well, because this is being regurgitated throughout the entire culture. Mm hmm. So, what next? Next, I put possession and MPD 14 similarities he gives us between people who exhibit. Behaviors of being demonically possessed and MPD. So number one is both possession and MPD are more frequently identified among women than men. Hmm. Interesting. Both, they both may occur sometime after traumatic experience, rituals, or ordeals. Three, both have associated with cults, primitive and pre-industrial. Um, four, both have secrecy is a factor. Five, both may have experiences for which he or she is later amnesic. Six, in possession and MPD, um, they may experience co-consciousness or shared awareness with the alter personality or possessing entity. Seven, they both <clears throat> frequently act out behaviors that are uncharacteristic of themselves. Eight, they both have strong factors of social control present, which some hypothesize to be related to the creation and expression of the inner identities. Remember James McAvoy? <laughs> 
<laughs> I was gonna it's say lit, like with his do- his uh, his dominant controlling woman is like that nanny that British nanny yes. woman. Yes, <laughs> I wanted to bring up Split because wasn't the therapist in on it, or wasn't there some kind of conspiracy? No, no, he and no her. in Glass he... in the one with Samuel L. Jackson. There was definitely some. Uh, in Glass, and... uh, it was like some group of uh like spec ops people that were sent to suppress people with uh with powers so oh yeah so ultimately it wasn't it wasn't uh bruce willis versus uh samuel L. jackson there was like this third other group that was Mm -hmm. trying to keep down everybody who had these uh abilities basically so this just makes me think of how they're trying to create superheroes, but they're saying the, the pop culture will start to push that being multiples is a superpower or being autistic is a superpower. Yeah, autism, or, uh, multiple personality, schizophrenia, uh, insanity are like, like new superpowers. And yeah. then that's, the, that's the evolved human beings. And then everybody else yeah. is like unevolved or whatever. X-Men. It, yeah. X-Men Neurotypicals stuff. are not heroes. That's what's in X-Men. Remember, uh, Professor X wants to, he turns bad because he wants to kill all the normies. And then yeah. the, and the X-Men are like, no, you can't kill all the normies. They're cute and fun and we love them. And then, <laughs> and then uh, not Professor X, Ma- Magneto. Magneto disagrees yeah. with Professor X over the normies. That's right. Mm-hmm. So number nine, they both um, usually present a personality that is often called the host or the core Ten, both are listed as dissociative disorders. Eleven, both the inner entities take control of the body may be characterized as animals, spirits, demons, and deities. Twelve, they both um, engage in behaviors which defy the recognized physical limits. That's split. Defy and by the, the way, recogni- uh, if, if, if anybody's uh, skeptical, in John C. Lilly's famous, <clears throat> I've covered many times, programming and metaprogramming the human biocomputer, uh, Lily discusses that when people would get really tripped out, a lot of times they felt like they were uh, contacting and, and being taken over by gods and spirits and demons. And then uh, in chapter uh, 1, pages 19, 20, 21, 22, up through 20 through 31, he discusses the ability to, he claims, to uh, split and create the altars like a like a computer program that's the whole point of this mm-hmm. book um he could wipe kids minds melt the, he could melt their uh core identities and uh later on he calls it trauma-based mind control on pages uh 126 and 127 essentially mm-hmm. yeah so that's scary it says they they defy the recognized physical limits that define normal embodied existence, particularly within respect to the perception of pain. So that's like the beast. Right? By the way, when I bought this book, it came with some note from the bookstore that I bought it. It was like some boomer hippie was like, it was like some goofy. I should have kept it. It was something like, dear Mr. Jason, man. Hey, dude, this book is going to blow your freaking mind, man. I'm just, <laughs> it was like, I'm just so glad that there's other psychonauts out there amongst you know, the people that are trying to find the truth of reality, man, like pierce on through something like pierce through the veil, bro. It was like, which book? when I bought the John C. Lilly book, oh. I'm like, you crazy boomer psycho. This is a, this guy's a <laughs> psychopath, psychonaut. Right. Yeah. But he was like, yeah, man, props to you dude. shout out to the other people out there seeking the truth, man. Break on through the other side, bro. Boomer Garcia. Yeah. Cause how many people are buying that book? Right. Well, yeah. not, not many. After we mentioned it, probably more people have been, been buying it. But Yeah. Yeah, Boomer Garcia so, wrote me a note, by the way. <laughs> we have two more. 13. Uh, reports have appeared that a disproportionate number of individuals affected by possession and MPD believe they have psychic or paranormal abilities. Uh, yes. 14. Uh, by the way, I think Huxley talked about that, too. There's a quote in the John Marks book. From Huxley talking about all, people also thinking that they were contacting uh, demons and and spirits mm-hmm. and gods and getting um, psychic powers and whatnot. So, the way I understand it is like you can have altars, 
but they're not, they're part of you. They're not a demon. But you can have altars that are possessed by a demon, if that makes any sense whatsoever. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, I don't have any definitive explanation of this, but... Uh, so it's uh, like, when they're right. deprogrammed, you have to go through all of these characters and altars and animals and things that say they're spirits and things that are just a fragmented part of your mind, like a little child altar, altar obviously is not a demon. It's just uh, a, he also discusses this in terms of the people who think that they are a million different genders too, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. Um, Ross, Ross discusses that in his book. So last one on this page, he says, they both share a lengthy list of concurrent problems, which include psychosomatic and other health complaints, family and marital problems, and explicitly psychological symptoms. So this reminds me of Lady Gaga. I just watched her documentary called Five Foot Two. And in almost every other scene, she's crying, uh, just laying down in pain. She can't get up. She can't walk. She did break her hip at one point, but now she's been diagnosed with fibromyalgia, which is something that they can't figure out. It's just phantom pain. They don't know what causes it. So this could be a product of how possession can be hard on your body and how you store things in your cells. It's not just all in your mind. Does she, uh, didn't she say her vagina was haunted or something like that? Or was that? That was Kesha. Was that Kesha? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I forget the, the pop thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Who's who. But, uh, yeah, they all tend to make these claims like this. And, uh, uh, you have to wonder, is it just attention seeking or, uh, no, actually maybe they really do have some of these issues. You know, it's hard to know yeah. in every case, but. Uh, I just saw some Britney was re uh, dressing up like uh, uh, Alice from Alice in Wonderland, which is interesting. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Recently? Uh, I, I think it was this year. I don't know how recent the picture was, but it looked pretty recent. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, maybe last Halloween or whatever. But um, what is the name of this book? I want to put the title of your book that you're, you're covering uh, up for, this, for people on the screen. Cult and Ritual Abuse. You want the subtitle? Um, you can just keep going. Okay. And that, uh, who's the who's the author? N Nisbet. James Randall Noblet, N O B L I T T. Okay. Yeah. Don't mind me. Just just keep going. Okay. So my next note is page fifty. Some survivors. What am I doing here? And again, if you're if you just tuned in, we're covering a uh, fairly well-known academic study on cults and uh, and research. So this is not a a conspiracy text. Um, mm -hmm. I'll put it up on the screen for you guys which book we're covering. And I want to remind you too that you can support us with super chats. We are taking super chats. So the book there's the book, Cult and Ritual Abuse, Randall Noblet, and what's that woman's name? I can't tell. Pamela. Pamela. Perskin, P-E-R-S-K-I-N. No, yeah. So there's the book, and uh, go ahead, keep going. Let's see. You can support us with Super Chats. We'll be reading the Super Chats when we come to the end of Part 1. And by the way, uh, tonight, the way it'll work is after we do Part 1, Jamie and I will immediately switch over and do Part 2. Uh, and that'll be available tonight. And then uh, I know I'm behind on a couple part uh, lectures. So after that, I will do part two of the Genesis Abraham lecture. And then tomorrow I should have uh, part two of the Basil talk. So uh, we'll be catching up on all the, the uh, part twos uh, tonight and tomorrow. So here he's talking about group therapy sessions. Um, and they do, the survivors call it programming. Um, also known as coercive, coercive persuasion. Now that makes sense. And, I mean, I mean, the MK Ultra doctors called it programming, so that's not far fetched. Right. I mean, the the you and Cameron uh, imprinting, and then um, yeah, the title of Lily's book is programming. Yeah, in which he calls the manipulation or traumatization of altered personalities, fragments, or other dissociated mental states or entities for the purpose of mind control. Some patients and therapists reported. That 
the stimuli which bring out particular and often programmed behaviors, moods, and states of consciousness called triggers. So this is what we already know. Um, these reported stimuli may be words, sounds, tones, pattern, a pitch, a sequence of pitches, visual cues, hand signals, colors, tactile stimulation. Some survivors state that virtually any stimulus can be used for the purpose of eliciting a pre-programmed response if that particular stimulus has been used previously as a signal for a repetitively traumatizing procedure. So, what that means is they can use anything in a ritual and attach the trigger to that so it could be something innocent. It could be something... It could be anything, as long as they made the experience traumatizing. It could be, you know, a Bible. It could be an icon. It could be Mickey Mouse. It could be a cartoon or any. So, right. And Lily, Lily, Lily says that Lily says that they could. He claims he could do that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So just because something is cute or innocuous looking doesn't mean that it cannot also have a nefarious I was watching purpose. some show it was either fringe or um um no it was uh black uh the blacklist the one with uh, James Spader that spy show and there was one of the episodes where the one of the triggers of one of the people was a record or a certain record when it played a certain song uh, if you if you watch blacklist you'll remember that episode it was one of the more more famous episodes but you see this come up a lot in, in uh, pop culture i think there's a uh, what's uh, uh, Charles Bronson movie Telephone, where the guy gets the phone call and he hears the trigger word. And if you saw, yeah, the, yeah. if you saw the new Manchurian Candidate, um, the Lee Schreiber character, he gets a phone call and he hears the trigger word. So you see this in pop culture, um, mm-hmm. and I guess it's somewhat debatable as to how uh, 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 you how proficient they are at this. I don't know, but at least in in the in the books that we're talking about tonight, they claim to be fairly prof- proficient in it. Mm-hmm. In the next page, he goes on to talk about Manchurian Kennedy. So he's right there on that same page with you. Okay, next note. What does that say? Page 54. Patients from different locations share commonalities. Oh, this this is something that uh, Colin Ross mentions too. Mm -hmm. Here's a weird story. You ready? Although the majority of my patients typically have no conscious memories of having previously known one another... It is curious that several of these patients have switched to alter personalities and identified one another by cult names when speaking to me privately and individually. For example, on one occasion, I was saying goodbye to a male patient diagnosed with NPD and inviting the next patient, Alice, into my office. Once inside my office, Alice Alice switched to a child alter personality who very fearfully inquired, why do you have Robert James coming to see you? Don't you know he's very dangerous? Because of patient confidentiality, I could not say anything about the male client with whom I had just visited. I could not even identify him as a patient. However, his real name was Robert Dale. Robert James was one of his secret cult names. How was it that Alice recognized him at all, much less identified him by his cult name? To my knowledge, he had not told that name to anyone else. That is, no one outside his cult. And to my knowledge, he had never seen or met Alice before. He neither greeted her nor recognized that he knew her when they passed each other in the waiting room. Alice also identified three others of my patients, allegedly from rituals she had attended in childhood, two of them by secret cult names that were only known to me, and presumably the cults where these individuals reportedly had been abused. Alice had also been recognized by the altered personalities of two other patients who in the private session revealed they had known each other from past cult experience. So you could be in a cult with someone and not even know it. Yeah, right, and so the... the psychiatrist is claiming that that the alters recognize one another right yes yeah but the core personality had never met that person before Mm -hmm. but in the cult they're old friends isn't that crazy it is yeah by the way be sure and smash like if you enjoy this chat and uh uh give us uh some support through the fat super chats if you would and uh we are talking to jamie about the book a satanic ritual cult abuse. Go ahead. Okay, next note. Here we go. Altars that are devoted to Satan or Lucifer, page 57. 
Okay, some survivors have altars who purport a sincere devotion toward a demonic entity such as Satan or Lucifer. These altars sometimes claim that they have voluntarily endured horrible rituals as a means of expressing their profound commitment to the demons, whom they sometimes revere as gods. However, in the majority of the cases I have encountered, there is a more agnostic and skeptical view of these demons' existence or status as gods. So, some of the altars are Satan worshippers and some are not. Yeah, by the way, uh, thank you for that mentioning Dollhouse. I forgot to mention the TV show Dollhouse, but uh, I did watch season one of that, and uh, it has all these same elements as well. I mean, this is everywhere in pop culture, right? I mean, we've covered this in many... It is pop culture. I mean, I, I mean, it's not just in all the spy shows. I mean, pop culture itself is the medium that's supposed to induce dissociation in the in the population, and it is, in fact, doing that. That's You wonder why people are going so crazy and acting so crazy is because the pop culture is intended to induce that by design. But uh, yeah. yeah, if you watch Identity with John Cusack, all this stuff comes up in Identity, uh, where uh, it's that one's interesting because the movie didn't have that good of a critical appraisal. I, I think it's a, not that bad of a movie, but it tells the story from the vantage point of the altars and in, in the head of the killer, which is an interesting twist on that altar thing. But um, the boy, if you remember, he's he has been traumatized since youth, uh, and so he's grown up as a serial killer. And the film is spoiler. Uh, the different altars in his head, and there's different things that cue and trigger them, right? Um, That's identity. Yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, you've seen Identity with John Cusack, right? Yeah, I just didn't know which movie you were talking about. Yeah, Amanda Peet, John Cusack. I forget who else is in it, but um, mm -hmm. but yeah, we see this uh, quite often in a lot of uh, uh, Hollywood, a lot of, of pop culture fiction. It, it makes for, I guess, not just for an interesting story, but there's also, you know, a, a lot of times that this is more real than people realize. Now, again, I'm not saying it's all real. A lot of it's just a bunch of baloney, but um, yeah. people are a lot. Now, I, I read about this stuff extensively 10 years ago, and, and in 10 years ago, people thought this was crazy stuff. Like, that's that's insane. That's nuts. Uh, remember Conspiracy Theory with Mel Gibson, right? I mean, that was my first encounter with this because he, they, when they kidnap Jerry, they bring him back and they and the, the Patrick Stewart character, Captain Picard, puts him back through his MK Ultra torture. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Because they kidnap yep. Mel Gibson and they he, they go and do put him in through the water torture. What I like about that movie is until the end, you don't know whether he really is crazy or he's right. Right, right. And um, sometimes you're thinking this guy's like Looney Tunes. In then... Esoteric Hollywood 2, I did a whole uh, giant chunk uh, where I covered movies related to um, MK Ultra, I, I include uh, in that section the chapter on John C. Lilly and and uh, conspiracy theory with Mel Gibson. But um, my list of movies related to mind control was Clockwork Orange, They Live, Lost Boys, American Ultra, The Cell, Neon Demon, Conspiracy Theory. Uh, had to select certain certain ones, but I mean, you could you could go into many many more. I mean, uh, there's many instances of Esther Hollywood one where I had movies related to mind control, like uh, Eyes Wide Shut and The Shining, mm -hmm. which I think directly relate to it as well. But uh, Stranger Things, Stranger Things comes up in here. Obviously, that was about explicitly about MK Ultra, uh, which is interesting that they would go that far. But yeah. But yeah, it's not accidental that it's suffused throughout pop, pop culture is what I'm trying to say. It's um, so meta. It is kind of meta. That's an interesting way to, to speak of it. Let's see what else. Um, Minority Report, uh, AI. I, AI deals with MKUltra. Uh, Blade Runner. Yeah. Um, Logan's Run because does. Zardoz does. Go ahead. The, the artists are t attempting to express their feelings with song and video right and, but they're traumatizing uh hitchcock uh this comes up pretty uh, uh consistently in hitchcock films. I mean, psycho you know he's got an alternate personality that's his crazy yeah. mom right yeah. um north by northwest uh it's it's hinted at in north by northwest with the the, the woman character who's being used by uh the the elite rich guy now he it's it's hard to tell whether he's you know, is she dissociated or is she uh, playing the part of a femme fatale to dupe Jimmy Stewart? But regardless, it's a double. And then Vertigo, or, excuse me, I'm thinking of Vertigo. Vertigo, it's hard to tell if the Kim Novak character is doing that. But in North by Northwest, um, 
it actually is the CIA that's using the the honey trap to trick Cary Grant. <clears throat> well, Cary Grant was that the one where he w- he married her and she started be crazy after they got married. Which one was that? No, North by Northwest is uh, uh, he gets wrapped up in a espionage operation by accident. Mm-hmm. And What's the they, send the bl- they send the bl- the blonde girl to help, like get him out of it, to mislead him, and she, yeah. she dupes him. Do you know which one I'm thinking of? Um, they're newlyweds. It's either Cary Grant or Sean Connery or somebody like that. Uh, he... It's Notorious. Notorious is the one where that's also the same type of stuff, but there's no alters in Not- Notorious. He's OSS, I think, in Notorious, and then. Uh, but Ingrid, she's a spy, and he's marrying her. He's a raven. He's entrapping her to try to find out about her dad, I think, who's a spy. Mm-hmm. I think that's what it is. Is that what you're talking about, Notorious? No, it, it was just like a movie about two newlyweds, and he didn't know. Oh, you're talking about crazy. the Hitchcock with uh, Marnie. Marnie, that's yeah, it. Marnie, yeah, in yeah. Marnie, she has multiple personality. Yeah. And he finds out that it was because of childhood trauma. Yeah. Uh, Strangers on a Train, too. Another Hitchcock with uh, doubles and multiple personalities. So this is everywhere in Hitchcock is the point. That's the point I'm trying yeah. to make. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, moving on. Um, oh, so... No, she's not thinking of uh, people in the chat. Everybody's debating now the movies. She's thinking of Marnie, not uh, uh, not Vertigo. Yeah, Marnie has Sean Connery, and I think it's in a Tippy Tippy Hedron. She's got multiple personality. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's it. So chapter seven of this book is called The African Connection. So he dedicates a whole chapter to how this ties in with voodoo. So (laughs) it's like you'd think those two things, psychiatry and voodoo, would be very far apart from each other, but they're actually not. Well, I mean, we know that the, the, uh, I mean, we just covered Food of the Gods, um, and we know that at least to some degree, Terrence McKenna was an asset of the government. And so the research that Carlos Castaneda and Terrence McKenna and, and the psychonauts, Timothy Leary, that was all for MK Ultra to some degree. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, we know with Terrence McKenna, there was an interest in shamanism and indigenous religions. And you might, there's no reason you wouldn't expand that to voodoo. Mm-hmm. Let's see voodoo. In my own research, I've learned that some authors prefer the term voodoo. Blah blah blah. He talks about voodoo voodoo. Now, by the way, uh, <laughs> that reminds me. Jamie and I have an old talk we did about voodoo, and we covered yeah. the top vo- Hollywood voodoo movies. A great stream that we did. That's kind of underrated. I need to add that to the uh, to the show description. So go ahead. I'm just thinking of that while you're doing it. He says voodoo is a possession cult with a formal liturgy. Mm-hmm. A Hugon is a priest. Um, female counterpart is a Mambo. The Vudon sorcerer is sometimes called a Bokor. The Vudon temple is called an Omfor, and its altar stone is the Pei. The peristyle is a partly enclosed courtyard, which in the middle has a center post. According to Ragan, some author about voodoo, the Omfor closely resembles the design used by Moses to build the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle stri- described in Exodus. That's so weird. Furthermore, he says, in the voodoo tradition, Moses was initiated into voodoo and perfected his knowledge as a student <laughs> of black Midianite teacher Jethro. Okay. The tradition relates... Th- By I'm the way, let me, let me just for a second here, let me pause there. Okay. That's funny. But so um, back in 2016, four years ago now, Jamie and I did an episode where we covered five Hollywood Illuminati voodoo movies. We did The Believers, mm-hmm. Serpent and the Rainbow, Angel Heart, Skeleton Key, and Live and Let Die. So I just want to remind everybody, it's a great show. If you're enjoying what we're talking about now, go back and listen to that old show that we did. That y'all, I'll put it in the chat right now. And I'm also going to put it in the show description below if you're watching this. You can go watch our old voodoo stream that we did, Hollywood Voodoo. And uh, you'll see, by the way, that yes, these topics make perfect sense with MK Ultra. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, where do I leave off? Moses. Moses as an in, okay. in, inductee Moses. of the uh, uh, voodoo mysteries. 
says the tradition <laughs> relates that Moses became the husband of Pethro's daughter Sephora, which is a really big cosmetics chain store. Now, Sephora. Yeah. Did That's you know that? No, I didn't know that. I mean, I okay. know what Sephora <laughs> is, but I didn't know that. No. Yeah. Who bore two mulatto sons by him, Gershom and Eleazar. The mm-hmm. tradition goes on to say that Aaron and Miriam, the brother and sister of Moses, complained that he never should have married a black. And so to please them, Moses finally repudiated Sephora. When Moses built the first Hebrew temple, according to the voodooist, he planted his staff in the place occupied by the Potomitan in the Omphor. The gods of voodoo were so angry at Moses' repudiation of Sephora and voodoo, according to the tradition, that they struck Miriam with white leprosy. Wow. That's so weird. <laughs> yeah, so, so the voodoo recast and retelling of the Moses story, that's interesting. But mm-hmm. what? But one thing that you recalled uh, too from the, I recall from the talk because you did a bunch of research on uh, voodoo and candomblé and all that before we did that talk, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you talked about how ultimately those systems are really close to Gnosticism. Yeah, and because... I, I, I say that because ultimately it doesn't really matter whether we're talking about voodoo or candomblé or shamanism. All of those traditions are essentially the same, and just like we saw with this recast of Moses, they'll just reinterpret everything in Christianity. It's oh, really? It's just talking about Gnosticism. Yeah. Therefore, it's these are not different ideas. They're all interested in the same thing. CIA is interested in uh, ethnography, mastering the re- the religious traditions of these countries, these indigenous peoples, and so MK Ultra was very, um, very much connected to indigenous religious traditions hence the emphasis on shrooms mm, right. i mean that's where they get lsd is from going and and i mean we just covered this with you know uh gordon wasson and, and the the analysis of uh, uh food of the gods of terence mckenna so there's i made a note that he is referencing a book another book that i had to get and read i actually read this one too it's called blood secrets by isaiah oak oke and he was a very powerful witch doctor baba larisha juju man in africa author of the book or the guy in the book both he wrote his own autobiography did he come so, out of this or he wrote it as a guy yeah, who's in it? Yeah. Yeah, no, he came out of it. Okay. Um, but I have read that and I have all notes on that. So maybe one day, if we ever feel like doing voodoo again, we can talk about that book. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Next point. The personality transformation dissociated amnesia and programming associated with an orisha which is a voodoo spirit whose cult ritual practices were carried out in what the author calls a covenant some dude named pierre verger became a priest of the orisha cult so he could not tell me about many of the secret ceremonies which took place in the convent but he was able to say that it was a severe brainwashing process in which the normal personality is replaced by a new personality The postulant is never permitted to remember his normal personality, what he was like, and how he behaved as his former self. But when he leaves the convent, he is given back his old personality by a special process and has little memory of what happened during the time in the convent. People go back into the convent from time to time and by the same hypnotic process revert to their godlike personality to emerge once more with their ordinary personality when they return to the outside world. So this reminds me of when they all go to rehab. Yeah, I was going to say, um, in the in the Kurth Barker book, he he discusses the uh, certain people who become handlers being their psychiatrists. Antlers. Handlers. Oh, handlers! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Handlers are the psychiatrists. <laughs> antlers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah. By the way, uh, you know what else this reminds me of? Uh, remember when we we I did the analysis of uh, I think you watched it with me, but I, I did the analysis of the the weird Christopher Lee horror movie to the devil a daughter. Remember that they traumatized her as a youth in those satanic cult rituals. And then they had the ability through that weird symbol to, to trigger her and basically put her in a trance state. Yeah. The girl who was the supposedly the, uh, what is she? She's the, uh, the nun. 
She's supposed to be a nun, but it's just secretly, it's a sex cult within the Vatican, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So my next note says, page 73, it was surprising. Now I put my analysis of To the Devil a Daughter in the chat. If you've never seen To the Devil a Daughter, it's, it's pretty great uh, for this subject matter, at least, because it has all these elements. Um, so I'm gonna, I'll add that to the show description as well, all these links. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh, here I found it. Okay, page 73 says, some patients reported abuse in rituals associated with all cultural groups, including Native Americans, Hawaiians, Australian, Aborigines, and the rest, which appeared similar to Sarah's accounts of traumatizing voodoo ceremonies. So this isn't just localized into any one religion, culture, mm -hmm. race, country. This is all of them. All paganism. This is what paganism is, basically. Yeah, somebody was saying it sounds like uh, theosophy. I mean, yeah, all these systems are just variants and, and recasts of the same thing. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. they're all, they all have the same basic structures to them. So. so he says, one classic anthropological work by the eminent scholar Clyde Clacon um, talks about Native American occult practices. He says, in Navajo witchcraft, they noted the extreme degree of secrecy associated with Navajo occultism and the reluctance of these Native Americans to discuss the subject. After extensive time was spent collecting data from interviews with the Indians, they concluded, there seems to be clear evidence that witchcraft is practiced. We as yet have no scientific certainty as to frequency or whether all the types which are described in words are indeed actualized in deeds. It was surprising to learn the extent to which abusive rituals have been documented throughout the world's diverse cultures, he says. Hmm. So. so they're studying religious rituals to per, to perfect the techniques of mind control. Right? Yes. And that's something that we, again, have come back to over and over and over when we look at um, the Globalism book series, when we looked at Terrence McKenna, when we looked at uh, Tim Leary, we looked at the Psychonauts. This is what we keep, John C. Lilly, this is what we come back to. Mm -hmm. He says he identifies this practice with the ancient Incan civilization and cites modern cases of human sacrifice, two of which he personally investigated. You, you want to, you want the natives to tell you their inmost secrets, secrets they pledge not to divulge, and which would incriminate members of the community if learned by the authorities. So that's pretty crazy. Are we says, are we halfway yet, or are we getting close to halfway? Um, I see we're third. Okay. Can you, uh, get us up to halfway and then we'll call, we'll do the super chats and then we'll move over to the, uh, uh, subscriber yeah. for, uh, the, oh, the... yeah, I'll tell you when we're half done. Okay. We're not that far. Um, he says, why has it taken anthropologists so long to acknowledge the existence of human sacrifice in a variety of new world cultures, even when there has been ample evidence of these practices? La la la. Many people, including scholars, tend to be in denial regarding the prevalence of human sacrifice. If one honestly scrutinizes the subject, it becomes apparent that human sacrifice is also part of Europe, Europe's heritage as well. It is a shared legacy that many prefer to deny. Right. So. Uh, yeah, that's a good point to bring it back to the human sacrifice. So, in other words, human sacrifice hasn't gone away. It's It's been present in different cults. It's went underground. Um, and then I think now, you know, you're seeing the resurgence of the, a lot of these it's really gross practices. Mm -hmm. Then he goes on to talk about aboriginals, Eskimos, ritual sacrifice of children is attributable to a variety of shamanistic and other cultures. So that's what shamanism is all about. Interesting. Repeated ritual murder is reportedly a characteristic practice of sorcerers from the Philippines. To become one who can practice Hilo, it is said that a man must first kill a member of his own family, and from then on, one or more victims each year. Oh, my note says sorcerers must kill. So it's kind of like a mafia. You know, you have to basically, you know, make your bones. Yeah, but for the devil. Right. Yeah. Right. Says one sorcerer said that the sorcerer's obligation to kill grows with time. The longer the sorcerer practices, the more frequently he has to kill. All informants agreed that once a sorcerer assumes such obligations, if he does not victimize others according to schedule, he himself will become a victim, struck down by his own instruments of sorcery that turn against him. As one sorcerer expressed it, if he does not kill, he gets seriously ill, and he only gets well when he kills. If he does not kill, he will die. 
So it becomes like an addiction and uh, you get sick yeah. if you don't, if you don't feed. Yeah. 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 I think Barker says the same thing about cannibals, doesn't he? Like it becomes an addiction. Mm hmm. The yeah. adrenochrome. Yeah. He says, well, then the noble, it goes on to say it is our hypothesis that repeated experiences of a trauma are a necessary precedent to the development of intrusive experiences of dissociated identity. Furthermore, Certain rituals that include blood sacrifice and the ritual eating of the sacrificial victim increase the probability of mentally internalizing the conceptualization of the victim or the entity that, entity that the victim symbolizes, creating disassociated identities or alter personalities. So <clears throat> cannibals, cannibalism reinforces this MPD. And how does you do that? Can you restate really that? How? Because it's traumatic and because they are they believe that they're actually taking that person inside them. Like when they eat the heart of their enemy, then they're as strong as their enemy or whatever. Like right. I understand that. that but how is it reinforcing? Oh, you mean because it's another person coming into you? Yeah. So that's an alter person in the, in the scheme. Yeah. Or they're, making, when the they're making people think this. Right. Okay. When the shamans have finished the kill, there is a double sensation, relief and guilt. So that's another, um, I don't know what you call that, a bind? Uh, yeah, it would bind, right? Like love is hate or freedom is slavery. A double or, bind, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Definition of sorcery is my next note. He says, we propose this is how black magic works. When a spell is cast or a curse or a signal is given, the spirit slave is effectively called out. The spirit slave is commanded to carry out a specific task for the sorcerer. Often this command is expressed merely in the form of signal. If the disassociation is great enough, this can be done without the victim's conscious awareness. If the sorcerer does not know the victim's programming or if the victim has no such programming, then the sorcerer's efforts may fail altogether. However, if the sorcerer has successfully programmed several individuals in the tribe without their awareness, then the community may have great fear and reverence for him or her, particularly after such magical powers may later be demonstrated. So, like, this is what, like, the witch doctors and the shamans are traumatizing a group of people that will follow them because he has mind control them. Right. right, so the the reason why like the CIA would want to study something like that would is pretty obvious at that point, right? So, in other words, if you're if you're wanting to control masses of population, and you look over at these shamanic uh, crazy people, like in Mel Gibson's Apocalypto or something, right? Like the priest has the ability to basically tell everybody, uh, you know, give me your firstborn, and they'll do it, right? So, yeah. Um, uh, so if you want to control society, you might want to study how and why those uh, crazy cult leading, you know, uh, high priests were able to do that. And hence why yeah. they, why the, the control structure likes to research and understand uh, drugs, um, dissociation in, in terms of uh, external stimuli, which is what pop culture is essentially mm -hmm. there to do is to induce the dissociative state, induce mania as some of the white papers say uh, in terms of the mass population, the mass mind. So, the model being the shaman, right? View the elite uh, and the social engineers like the shaman. Mm -hmm. He says sorcery may, sorcery may be defined as the use of ritual magic and cues that are designed to cause psychological changes in others by triggering or accessing dissociated mental states in such individuals. Witchcraft may be defined as a more specific form of sorcery in which the practitioner believes that he or she has made a pact with a spiritual entity which could be a dissociated state or alter personality of the witch. The witch may then use ritual magic or other cues to cause mental changes both within the witch as well as within the external person who is bewitched. Witches purportedly perform black magic with the aid of an evil deity or demon, but they are also indebted to that malignant entity. In other words, true witches have undergone some ceremonial procedure whereby one or more dissociated entities have been created in themselves. Such a dissociated entity could view itself as a demon or malevolent god, depending on the procedures by which the entity is created and the beliefs of the cult. Such a practice could be passed down through families, thereby facilitating the secrecy of the procedure. So there's this 
psychiatrist talking about witches and sorcery and witchcraft and voodoo. All because he just wanted to be a therapist. Right. So he's thrown into this world of, you know, what people think is superstition. And, uh, and then mm-hmm. you come to find out, uh, oh, a lot of the elite at, are into this. The CIA studied it, you know. Uh, by the way, I mm-hmm. think this is the HBO documentary. That Yeah, this is it. I mentioned it. I'll put the HBO documentary into the chat. It's also illustrative for all the stuff we're talking about because it covers these topics, um, again, from a documentary perspective. So you can see that, you know, there's plenty of material out there that's not kooky, crazy, temple of hat land. Mm-hmm. So we're about halfway. Um, you want to do the super chats? Yeah, we'll do this. Uh, so if you want to give us a super chat, support us right now, you can. Um, I want to mention some of the books that... that uh, kind of changed my mind on this topic of course there's the dave mcgowan book which uh is written kind of from a um you could call it a conspiracy theory i think it's i think it's pretty solid in most of its argumentation so program to kill is a classic we just did uh two talks two two movie analyses uh that covered program to kill so i won't rehash that but um this is the book i'm presently reading is the kurth barker book cannibalism blood drinking high adept satanism I can't vindicate all of his claims and stories, um, I, so I don't. It's kind of like in the Fritz Springmeier, Kathy O'Brien category of where I'm not saying it's all wrong, or it's just that sometimes there's personal anecdotes that you can't prove or disprove. But uh, I will say that so far, what I've read from the Barker book, um, he's pretty accurate in terms of where he predicted society would go. Like he said that that where the elite will take society in the next several years, he's been right about all those predictions. So a lot of what he said is accurate. Um, if you want something, again, in the realm of like for Springmeyer stuff, Bloodlines of Illuminati is worth reading. I know that this kind of receives a lot of shade over the years because it's like the conspiracy book. Uh, it's actually not that bad. I mean, uh, there's a couple places where I would reject his sources, like uh, um, who's that one guy that came out as a fraud? John Todd. That stuff's all baloney. But, I mean, a lot of the information here, he actually cites Tragedy and Hope. He cites, um, you know, some pretty significant stuff. So, uh, it's conspiratorial, but it does have good information. So, I'll say that that one is worth reading if you want to read it. In the realm of less out there and more, it's still in the conspiracy world, but less out there. There's the Boert book, Walter Boert, Operation Mind Control, which I did a talk on. Uh, In a similar vein to that is the John Marks book, the famous book, uh, CIA and the Manchurian Candidate. This, these books have been vindicated, by the way, right? Like everything that's in the Boert and Marx book written in the late 70s, uh, that's all been vindicated. Like all the stuff that they said at that time, that was, oh, that's crazy conspiracy theory. That's all mainstream news now. NPR this year just put out a giant, or last year put out a big, uh, oh, by the way, all that stuff about culture is all true. And then, of course, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, there's the, uh, the, the Colin Ross uh, Satanic Ritual book, Abuse book, which is similar to the book that Jamie's covering tonight. Dr. Ross also has a book, CIA Doctors. Uh, in terms of intelligence analysis, Gordon Thomas, who does a lot of uh, books on intelligence. So this is from the vantage point of like MKUltra CIA intelligence research. Gordon Thomas's book, Journey into Madness, which is a famous MKUltra book as well. And then there is, uh, in the Globalism book series, we did the John C. Lilly book. You've heard me do programming, metaprogramming, and human biocomputer. And then there is the Dr. Ross book, uh, Mobile Personalities, Osiris Complex. And then there's the book Switching Time, which I've read many years ago. So I've literally put like years and years and years into reading this. I'm not just talking out of my butt. I've, I've read extensively on this. And then the, the two best books on this subject are me. <laughs> Esoteric Hollywood 1 and Esoteric Hollywood 2. You can get signed copies of Esoteric Hollywood 1 and 2 at my website, where I cover this from the vantage point of pop culture, but I also source it in uh, all these kind of books that you see us covering tonight. Um, Jamie, did you want to mention any books before we do the Super Chats? Um, Man, let's uh, go to my stack and see what's I mean, there. You don't, you don't have to. If you want to just mention a couple that you think are good on this, you can. Yeah. Now, Jamie has a book. Jamie has a great book called Hollywood Mind Control, <laughs> which she could recommend. Yes, I do. <laughs> I've got The Devil on the Doorstep by Annabelle Forrest. I've got Other Altars by Craig Lockwood. I've got one called Rabbit Hole by David Scherter. I've got Ritual Abuse and Mind Control by Three. Looks like 
therapist, the manipulation of attachment needs. That's interesting. I've got PS- PTSD Time to Heal by Kathy O'Brien. I've got the Fritz Springmeyer tomes. Got Victims No Longer by Mike Liu. Satanic Ritual Abuse Principles of Treatment, Colin Ross. Of course, I've got Access Denied by Kathy O'Brien and Transformation of America. I've got A Child Called It by Dave Peltzer. I've got the Corey Feldman book. I've got Physical Control of the Mind by Jose Delgado. Mm -hmm. And Suffer the Child by Judith Spencer. So that's my bookshelf on. Oh, no, there's Michelle Remembers. Yeah, I don't want. We're we're not going to recommend Michelle Remembers, though, because it's actually (laughs) that's been shown to be uh, BS. So I'm not going to recommend that one. But. um, it's interesting for disinformation because I think that book is pretty easy to show was was disinfo. But um, okay, we'll talk about in the second hour because they're they're going to talk about that. Or a, a good chunk of his book is him fighting these false memory syndrome foundation. Right now, we know that was a CIA uh, disinfo uh, disinformation thing for sure. Yeah, that's well known. Um, all right, let's get to uh, super chats. We have Rolfling Stakes five dollars. What do you think of the Satanic Temple and the False Memory Syndrome Foundation? Yeah, Michael Aquino was connected to Orrin and all those people uh, in the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. And that I would say that was a thing that they set up to kind of try to uh, dispel anybody exposing this stuff. Uh, it, well, he's got a whole chapter in his book dedicated to how the media and this False Memory Syndrome have tried to discredit him and make him and the people look crazy and get them in trouble with the FBI and, and well, they, the people who were behind the false memory syndrome foundation yeah. have been like convicted of all kinds of horrendous things. Yeah. So that was a yeah. bunch of gibberish and evil and wickedness and disinformation. So, so we know that yeah, the false memory syndrome foundation was full of it, but I also suspect, um, I can't really prove this other than to cite the example of Michelle remembers being pretty preposterous. I, I think that, um, some of those sensational books that kind of spark the satanic panic that that happened on purpose to, to basically mm-hmm. make everything about it look stupid. And That's that was actually, that was a great cover. Um, um, if you watch that movie, there's, there's an example of this where PR people can do this. Um, that movie with Jessica Castain where she's works at a PR firm. It actually mm-hmm. shows how they do this. They'll, they'll put out like crazy stories to dispel information about a real story. Yeah. Um, do you guys know what I'm talking about? What's that Jessica Chest did? Because it's a really, watch that movie because it's about how PR firms can do this, how they can create uh, BS stories to dispel and distract from a real story. Um, I don't know. It came, it, it's, it's, it's got like a feminist message. I'm not endorsing the whole movie, but uh, that movie with her illustrates this point very well. Anyway, go ahead. That's all the books I have on it right okay. now. Okay. Uh, next super chat is, yes, part two will be for members only to Jay's analysis. Uh, Acrobatic Jesus, five bucks. Yo, dude, I'm catching up on your videos. Keep up all the hard work, Jay. Thank you, Acrobatic Jesus. Yes, we have, we've been really pumping out content lately, so, uh, appreciate that. And, um, hopefully we can continue to grow, uh, smash that like button. Give us a share. Appreciate that. Thank you for the super chat support. Vladiro, he says for 10 Canadian. Thank you for the work that you do. I love to hear more on this topic. How many individuals do you think are under the influence of my control? And also, Joker has Arthur. Joker has Arthur with a backstory, uh, yes, of childhood abuse. Exactly. I think the Joker is a, uh, I don't know, that he's not like intentionally like a mind control asset. He just sort of like has this bad stuff happen and he, he sparks, right? But the Joker does present it interestingly as a... Uh, foil to Batman, right? Bruce Wayne's dad is kind of a jerk, right? <laughs> so you see it from the side of the Joker that, you know, he's kind of vindicated in like he was uh, mistreated, right? Bruce <laughs> Wayne's dad is a, is a piece of crap, but, um, you know what I, what to answer that question, if you're not aware of what we're talking about right now, then you are a victim of this. He to says, a, to a degree, yeah, to a degree, to some I mean, to extent, like, there's a spectrum, obviously, but I mean, there's plenty of there's plenty of uh, Amish Mennonite girls who grow up just eating bread and butter and getting fat who have never heard of, of MK Ultra <laughs> Prairie Muffin Girls, and but and they're not under MK Ultra because of, although uh, you could argue, by the way, that I would say Mennonite Amish stuff like a is a form of mind control too. So uh, that is a weird. They're, yeah. they're a crazy cult too, by the way. 
Um, yeah. But I would say that uh, everybody through pop culture is under the influence of mind control. Um, how many people are actually under being taken to some underground base somewhere? Very, very few. Very, very few. Mm -hmm. um, Jack, two dollars. Few, but more than you think. I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, I'm saying it per capita, like compared to the rest of the population. No. Mm -hmm. uh, Jack, two dollars. Jay and Jamie, how would you define wisdom? I would say uh, the way Proverbs does. Proverbs says in Proverbs one, wisdom, beginning of wisdom is uh, the fear of the Lord. So fear of God, God's word. That's the beginning of wisdom. Um, yeah, easy. Doorman, three sixty two dollars. So pop music is mass hypnosis and or magic spells. Both. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Is it mass hypnosis yeah, what, or what's magic spells? the difference, spells? really? Go watch Josie and the Pussycats because, again, the movie shows that the military-industrial complex creates the trends and puts them out there. Yeah. Nicodemus the Pharisee, $5. Do you think it's possible that demons are using these people to slander the elite and demoralize society? Uh, no. I don't think that people who come out of ritual abuse are slandering the, the elite. The elite for the most part, are actually evil and degenerate. <laughs> They're not slandering them. Not everybody but amongst, not everybody rich, hmm? not everybody rich is a Luciferian agent. I'm not saying that. But the top elite, like the top, top of the of the family structure, the world structure, which, by the way, the studies have shown that the, the whole world economy is controlled by like a handful of uh, super conglomerates. Um, there's that that uh, Swedish study that, that came out a few years ago that demonstrated that a very small uh, group of uh, conglomerates and corporations can literally control the world economy. That's mm -hmm. not a conspiracy. That, that That's like hard data now. But it is part of psychological warfare to demoralize a population through attacking their president. Leaders. That's true. Like, that part's true. Bill, Bill but, Clinton, but, the people who, but the people who are coming out and talking about the degenerate elites are not doing it because um, they themselves are trying to destroy the system. Some of them may, but you're correct that it's it, there's an aspect to which the elite don't mind this stuff coming out. We're in the age of uh, externalization of the hierarchy. They don't mind it coming yeah. out because they don't mind the existing system collapsing because it will, in their mind, it will lead to the uh, the the breakaway civilization, new world that's yeah. coming. Like there was no reason for the Monica Lewinsky scandal to happen in public. I mean, I'm sure lots of presidents cheat and stuff. So why was that news? I think it's like you say, externalization of the hierarchy. And it's also psychological warfare to break down the American, uh, confidence in the office of president. Yeah. Uh, who's the, the madam, uh, she even said this in an interview. What, Heidi Fleiss? Yeah, I, Heidi even said that, uh, her whole story demoralized the country. Like she, even she yeah. can recognize it. She's like, yeah. she's like, she says Epstein. things are way more permissible now in the whole country because of her and because of the media covering her. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, so a lot of times these stories come out to demoralize the whole country and socially engineer. Um, okay, I don't see any more Super Chats. Thank you, guys. If you want to see the rest of this talk, you can subscribe to Jay's Analysis at my website. Uh, and uh, you can get my book, Esoteric Hollywood 1 and 2. You can get Jamie's book, Hollywood Mind Control, where we kind of document all this stuff. Um, you can also subscribe here on the YouTube channel now as well. I have memberships here. Uh, part two of this will be later on tonight in the next few hours. Uh, if I have enough energy, I will try to also get tonight uh, part two of the Abraham and Isaac talk. And then uh, tomorrow, hopefully, I'll have the St. Basil talk part two complete. Um, but anything else you want to leave us with, Jamie? Um, no, I'm good. Thanks for coming. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for coming on. It was a great chat. Uh, God bless everybody. Uh, have a good night. And, uh, now, I mean, it's just crazy too, that like Epstein and all this stuff like that has shown how, like how real all this stuff is. Like, so even normies now are kind of exposed to this stuff mm -hmm. that we've been talking about for 10, 15 years is now kind of entering into the normie realm, which is, uh, which I think ultimately, it's not just a demoralizing thing. It's actually a good thing because, you know, we have to eventually face up to this stuff being real. It's not just, uh, you know, Hollywood fiction. It's all, it's all unfortunately real. Yeah. All right. Uh, have a good night, everybody. We'll talk to you soon.